Hey, welcome back to the uh, Hangar Deck Podcast. This is Whitey. I'm out here at the Military Aviation Museum down here in Pungo, Virginia. If you don't know where that is, you're among the many. <laughs> 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 look, look for the strawberry fields, man. That's right. It's gorgeous country out here, though, and it's a gorgeous day. 19 June 2021, ma'am is back flying warbirds, and that's good to hear. Um, we're out here on, they're calling it the Warbird Weekend. This is not to be confused with the warbirds over the beach. That's actually coming up in October, so mark that on, on your calendar. Keep an eye on their website for the exact dates. I don't have those right now in front of me. But uh, October, mid-Atlantic, Virginia, should be gorgeous weather. Come on out for that show in October, man. Um, <clears throat> so I'm walking across the, uh, the field out here and many displays out there with the reenactors and stuff. And one thing that caught my eye was the nose section of a B-25J with the, uh, some fantastic artwork on the nose uh, sandbar with a beautiful woman riding a bomb. Can't beat it. Went over, approached the table, and uh, met up with a fellow, Patrick Mahalik. Mahalik. Sorry, Patrick, I just butchered that right you off the it, bat, good. didn't you're I? Good. It's okay. And uh, he is with Warbirds of Glory. They're out of Brighton, Michigan, and they are restoring this aircraft. Um, Patrick, if you just want to lead in with, uh, tell us about Sandbar. So the Sandbar Mitchell project started basically in 2013. It was a dream of mine. As a little kid, as I watched this B-25, there was a 1992 Warbirds International magazine that had a story in it about this B-25 sitting out there on this sandbar in the middle of the Tanana River. And uh, it was, you know, one of those stories that I never forgot. And uh, through college, I just continued, you know, following it and realized that that airplane, you know, every year people went out there, shot at it, took more parts off of it. Um, so I said, something needed to be done. So we basically formed the Warbirds of Glory Museum around this B-25. I had acquired some parts, um, some airframe pieces from a B-25 that used to be on display. And I uh, just was collecting other B-25 bits and pieces over the years and was very fortunate that uh, a letter to the original owners, the Thor's Ruds, uh, came back with they love my story and they said they'd be willing to sell us the airplane for a dollar. So we bought a B-25 registration for one dollar. And now we had to go ahead and get all the permit processes and salvage rights in the state of Alaska. So uh, with the ownership from uh, the Thorswoods, that helped out a lot. And basically, we went out there in April and uh, viewed the airplane. What was left out there was really the center section, which was the main wing spars and part of the about five feet of the forward fuselage section and the rear fuselage section. But it was missing the top of it because someone came out there and cut that off. And... Uh, so we, uh, between April and uh, the June, we put together a whole recovery team. We raised the funds necessary to go out there and recover it. And we went out there and in a week successfully recovered the aircraft from the sandbar. Wow, that's amazing to hear. A buck. A buck gets you a V-25. That's great. Um, one of the things that you, you know, briefly talking to you outside, you talked about the program of the restoration. And... Um, somewhat of an apprenticeship training absolutely that's tied to it as well yeah so basically um when we got the airplane back uh you know one thing that we did was we were very uh you know social media and and letting everybody know hey we, we recovered this airplane and i mean we were putting uh stuff in the newspaper um basically saying hey we're looking for parts and come to find out a lot of the parts that's that walked away off the aircraft started showing back up at our door so, like, the horizontal, you know, the verticals, a lot of the uh, cockpit items, a lot of that kind of stuff. But uh, it really started with uh, Logan Kucherik, who was 13 years old at the time, knocking on the hangar door, you know, wanting to be involved in... Uh, he flew radio-controlled airplanes, actually, and was looking for a spot to fly one. And uh, so I, at the time, was working on finishing up a, a customer's airplane, and Logan wanted to help out, so I started letting him help out. And the next thing you know, the B-25 came about. We started, you know, building a museum to get the airplane, got it. And then uh, Logan asked, he goes, hey, could I bring, you know, my friend Anthony over? I said, sure. And next thing you know, I had 10 kids knocking at my door that were, you know, 15, 16 years old that just loved history. They were part of a history club. Um, they loved aviation, and they just, they just shined. And these kids just took off. I mean, it was like, you know, I gave them some North American drawings. Come to find out, you know, a lot of these kids had CAD class, like a CAD stuff. They started reverse engineering. And I said, we have something here. So uh, that's how our youth mentorship program uh, started. And uh, basically so far we've had over 45 kids now come through this. And a lot of the kids as they get older, they go off, you know, either aviation maintenance, military or aer aerospace engineering. They're still involved in the museum, but now they're the mentors teaching the newer students. So we call this like perpetual learning. 
And uh, right now I have a student who's 18. He actually started when he was 17. And basically, I mean, David is, you know, world class. Uh, you know, I give him parts. He'll reverse engineer it. He takes the North American drawings. He'll do all the CAD work, write the G-code, run the CNC, make all the tooling, make all the parts. And then at uh, the latest project, um, so when we brought Sandbar actually back, the first thing was taking the center section completely apart down to the individual spar caps to make sure that we had uh, a center section that could be made airworthy because our goal is to make a flying B-25 that is one of the most authentic flying B-25s out there. And uh, so these spar caps, we had NDT'd. We got a good build of health, and we started putting them all back together. But uh, some of these other projects, we have some students that want to, you know, like our glass nose, that was one of the first big projects that they took on and did. And uh, we just ended up acquiring a Bell M7 tail turret, and uh, we are actually one part away from having that finished to fully operational condition with the controller being the original controller from a B-25 that crashed out in Italy that we're trying to actually make our airplane represent. But... Uh, so the, one of the students wanted to, you know, take on the tail cone project. So we actually removed the eight-foot part uh, subassembly of the rear fuselage, brought over the hangar. We built a fixture around it, designed it, built it. Um, we have a company, Automation and uh, Modular Components, out of Davisburg, Michigan, that uh, sponsors us with the fixture materials. So they provide all the materials for the fixture. And uh, the students went ahead, designed all the uh, mounting points for it, got it in the fixture, uh, completely disassembled it, and drilled every rivet out. They already have made all the brand new skins for it. They've already uh, started making the new ribs that were damaged need to be replaced. And uh, right before we came down here, they just started making and bending some of the uh, sheet metal parts that uh, uh, for the laundron, I mean not laundrons, but for the uh, stringers inside the fuselage. You know, what caught my attention when you, when you briefly out front there when you mentioned it was you talking about the kids coming in and doing this stuff. That is, in my eyes, monumental. You know, I mean, and I got to say, if I was a kid, you're talking about, that would have been my dream right there, is to have something nearby for me to go and do that with. I mean, as much of an airplane geek, nerd, whatever you want to call me, was as a, as a teenager growing up, man, uh, that's fantastic. And that's something I, that was, you know, that's why I want, really wanted to get you to sit down, not only just tell you a story about you guys restoring this airplane, but the fact that you have the youth involved is fantastic. Um I don't think there's a Cub Scout unit out there that's going <laughs> to no. teach kids what those kids are going to be learning and, and, and what they're going to be doing. I have parents that have driven their, their you know, son or daughter you know, over an hour and a half to come here. And actually, one of, Caitlin, one of our newer students, um, she actually got drug in because of her boyfriend, Anthony. But Caitlin came in, and you know, she was around the hangar for two weeks. You know, and her background was working on hot rods with her dad. And she, you know, this first time being around airplanes. And she's like, I love this. And she now is actually going to uh, a trade school in Michigan to get her A&P to become a female aircraft mechanic. Wow, and it's all through being a part of the museum and working on the B-25. Now, again, real quick, where could, if someone's hearing this right now and they're like, you know what, my kid's interested in airplanes or some kid, if you're out there and you're going, wow, where can I, you know, once it, you guys have a website or something yep, like these guys can uh, pop Yep, it's warbirdsofglory.org. And through there, you can get our Facebook page. It's Facebook. Um, it's uh, B25 Sandbar Mitchell. Awesome. And, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping uh, to get, you know, we want to keep growing our youth program. Right now, the hangar that we're currently in, we actually have a backlog of students just because we don't have the space. And we just came to find out that uh, the hangar we've had since 2013, which has been a great home at the Brighton Airport, um, we're at the point now we have to move to Livingston County Airport because the hangar is going to be going for sale. So uh, we have an opportunity right now to, to get a new home at the Livingston County Airport, which will be big enough to house the B-25, house the restoration program and our student program allow us to grow it. So we're just looking for some support out there to make this happen because basically by fall of next year we will be without a home. So, Well, let's hope you find that home. We we'll, will. We'll do what we can on our yeah. end as far as promotion. We, you know, this is going to be on our Facebook page, on our normal Hanging at podcast.com page. Um, well, we, you know, uh, the maintenance folks here, TK and his crew down there, they're great fellows. And uh, Absolutely. You know, we'll even link it. We'll link it into, into their Facebook page. I'm sure he wouldn't have an issue with that. Um, the other thing you mentioned was the authenticity of this restoration and where you guys, what your focus and goal is on that. Uh, could you could you touch on that some? Yeah, so um, one, one of the things with the airplane is we were very fortunate that there was a B-25 that actually crashed. So we, uh, it's, it's 44-28898, and it was actually a Russian Lend-Lease B-25 that was basically brand new from North American, got put in the Lend-Lease program, was delivered up into Fairbanks, and then it had a botched landing at Nome at Satellite Field. And they basically pushed the airplane off the runway there, and it sat there for years. They picked, They used it for parts. 
people shot at it, and then it eventually actually ended up being pushed into the t- county dump. And uh, a gentleman, you know, through once again with the recovery of Sambar Mitchell, uh, you know, happened to be up in Nome and told me about this. So we went up there and actually met with some people, and, and through a lot of uh, negotiation work, we were able to actually get that aircraft. Um, so we brought that B-25 back to Michigan, and uh, really, you know, it is a time capsule because it was never modified. You can look at it. You can see the way North American really built that airplane. Um, you can see, you know, how the parts were painted before assembly was, sub-assemblies were painted. Um, so we went through and we documented a lot of this stuff, a lot of video, a lot of pictures. Um, then we started going through, and, you know, even when it comes to uh, looking at a lot of the markings, uh, so what we did is, you know, with the uh, spars on Sandbar, once we got the spars uh, NDT'd and got a clean, clean bill of health during the fixture, it was really starting getting these main front and rear spars, which are 26 feet long, back together. So the uh, we went ahead and things like, you know, the spars. So we looked at the Russian one, and we removed a couple of rivets so we can pull the actual spar webbing, which goes between the spar caps. And we could see that North American basically painted, you know, the, the uh, zinc chromate yellow on the spar cap. And then in the bomb bay section of the fuselage, they shot interior green, ANA 611 interior green. Then they riveted this, the, the webbing on. So, I mean, we did stuff like that. Then we started looking at, you know, all the markings. And you got your Reynolds markings, you got your Alcoa markings. And we saw three different types of Alcoa markings with different, you know, fonts types, you know, italic, you know, bold, this stuff. So we went ahead and actually took a flatbed scanner and put it inside the wing of this B-25 and scanned it and then put it in, you know, uh, Illustrator. And once again, you know, our students, they, they went through, some of them are uh, graphic design students, went through and actually recreated all these markings. We had a local company make us the stamps. We researched the ink, and we are taking all of our new aluminum. We are hand stamping all the original markings on before we, uh, uh, we actually are using epoxy-based paint. So we actually go ahead and we put our, our primer on first, then put the markings on, then put our yellow paint on top, the zinc yellow on it. I mean, we spent six months researching the paint. Um, using parts from the real 8Z that sat for 70 years in storage, so we know the paint has not seen light. We've had, you know, we've removed layers of paint on sandbar to get to the original paint, and same thing with the Russian one to 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 get the paint correct. And uh, finally, a company out of Oklahoma was able to mix the paint to be authentic to where I was happy with it. Um, then comes down to like the rivets, for instance. North American back then, when they built these airplanes, they used a, a modified brazier head rivet which was called the 2R1. It was a North American spec rivet. And we actually went ahead, instead of just using universal head rivets, uh, we went ahead and actually had uh, a national rivet out of uh, Wisconsin, went through and uh, reproduced the original North American rivets for us with, you know, all the proper head markings, uh, you know, proper anodizing and all that. And even, uh, we, you know, we worked with Air Corps 2 to get our 442 rivets, which are the flat type head rivets. And, I mean, we're just we're trying to make this as original as possible. It sounds like you're well on your way, and uh, I'll tell you what, all that talk about paint got Darren and I even, you know, another side project of ours is we're, we're scale modelers, so whenever we hear paint in, in World War II subjects is, is, you know, something that we certainly get into, and uh, so here, yeah, <laughs> here an ANA, ANA 611 tossed out there that you guys are going through that level of getting it right, Yeah, that, 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 that piques my interest. And, and we joke around a lot about that, too, because, you know, even talking with Carl out there at AeroTrader, who's one of the, uh, I mean, he's he is the go-to guy for B-25 stuff. And, you know, and Carl, you know, when we were talking about paint stuff, you know, like an actuator, for instance, you know, he's like, well, what color do you want? He goes, I got them silver. I got them zinc yellow. I got them green. He goes, and they're all new old stock parts. I mean, it really was what North American had at the time. They just used what they could use, you know. But it's like when it comes to seeing, though, how for us really – you know, looking at these bulkhead assemblies and saying, okay, that was all riveted together, then they painted it, then they brought the assemblies in. Because, I mean, like for the the rear fuselage, for instance, I mean, you have your top section, you have your two side panels, and you have your bottom section. And it's neat when you actually look and you can see how they went ahead, built those panels separately, painted them, brought them in position, then riveted them in place where you could see all the little gussets at the bottom of the laundrons meeting the ribs, and those rivets have no paint on them whatsoever. So it's, it's stuff like that. It's just this, this, this neat history that's there. And, and that's what it's all about is preserving that history. Man, I'm floored by that. Yeah. That, that, is, that is fantastic stuff to hear. And we'll be at Oshkosh this year. We're really excited about it. One of the things we're trying to do is um, we actually, um, for the last few years, everybody's seen our glass nose. That's what we've taken everywhere because we would love to take some of the bigger stuff, but we just can't because you just can't you know, transport it. But nice, uh, nice enough, our uh, tail cone fixture is actually 
transportable. So our hope is actually to bring this fixture to Oshkosh with the eight-foot rear fuselage so people could see kind of the restoration process, the stuff that the student's been doing, and hopefully we're going to have our Bell M7 tail turret attached in the back of it so that people can see that. Oh, nice. And, yeah. uh, and, and all the work that went into making that turret actually operational again. So that's a whole story on its own. Let, let, let me ask you this. Can, can you give us a little bit of history on Sandbar itself, how it became uh, – to, to be where it is, where, where it was at rest, uh, and maybe a little bit of history of the aircraft uh, leading up to its, its uh, final resting spot there. Absolutely. Um, so it's kind of a unique story, too, because Sambar actually is the sister ship to Larry Kelly's Panchito. So our serial number is 4430733, and his is 734. Um, so both aircraft you know, went down the assembly line side by side at North American and Kansas City. And then after the war, I mean, before after she was built... Um, it was a later late built J model. Um, it actually ended up going into storage, and then from storage it was modified to what was known as a TB25. So basically, what they did is they went in and removed all the bomb equipment, moved all the guns, the turrets, and that stuff, and converted it over for flight training. Um, so the aircraft actually served basically in Texas and Oklahoma at different bases. It got transferred between uh, just basically teaching bomber pilots. Um, later, you know, in, in, through the 50s. Finally, it ended up over at uh, Davis Mountain Air Force Base where it was mothballed and put in storage and finally put up for sale. And it was bought by Johnson Flying Service out of Missoula, Montana. And uh, they basically took and modified that aircraft for fire suppression bombing. So one of their pilots, Edgar Thorsrud, flew that airplane for many years out there, you know, around Montana fighting forest fires. And they had an issue where three B-25s were lost and at that point in time, the DNR said we're, we're, we're done operating B-25s down here in the, low, in the lower 48. So at that point in time, the Bureau of Land Management of Alaska, they still loved them. They were still using them up there. So basically, Edgar bought the B-25 and took it up to Fairbanks to uh, go ahead. We'll let the airplane take off here. Uh, t- took it up to Fairbanks and uh, basically was using it up there for force fighting and also to break up. They would drop ash on the Tanana River to help break up the ice pack. And uh, basically June 27th of 1969, uh, Edgar was not available to fly the airplane. He had some uh, family medical issues going on. So his friend Herm Gallagher was actually piloting it. And they were were fighting the big Manly Hot Springs fire up there. And basically uh, out of Fort Wayne right there, they were getting low on fuel. So they went ahead and Eilson Air Force Base brought a fuel truck up. And there's two different stories that we heard. This one was that basically Sandbar was the first one to get fuel from that fuel truck, and there was some kind of contamination in the fuel, whether it was water or if it was, we've heard it was jet fuel, but there was enough residual fuel in the tank that once he got off the ground and started turning towards the fire, that's when both engines quit. And so basically Herm just successfully geared up, landed the B-25 on the Sandbar and walked away from it. And then the other story is that he uh, overboosted the engines on takeoff, and uh, that uh, didn't go too well, which could have been the possibility, but, uh, you know, there's the two stories. But the airplane basically, um, Edgar went out there and uh, they removed the engines with his mechanic. They took the flight control surfaces off. They took the instruments and then the airplane was left there abandoned. And at the time it was just known as, you know, Antique 8, 8Z because it had 8Z painted on the tail. Its uh, end number is November 9088 Zulu, so that's why we believe the 8Z was on the tail. And uh, the locals used that airplane as kind of as a spot or reference for Fairbanks International Airport for where it was at. So they called it the Sandbar Mitchell because of that, and that's how she got her name. So it became known as Sandbar Mitchell. So what what is your organization, what is the plan for your final markings on this thing? I saw some artwork out there on the nose piece. So can you get, can you lead into that probably and tell us some um, end product? What, what, what are we going to be looking at on the flight line? So she will always stay Sandbar Mitchell. Um, the one thing you do know with nose art is that uh, you see Dale Arden, who was Flash Gordon's girlfriend with the lightning bolt, riding the Mitchell. And the reason is that is that, uh, you know, when she was a fire bomber, she had the 8Z adorned on the tail. And I really wanted to leave that on the aircraft to honor its firefighting heritage, but we also want to bring it back to an authentic B-25. So doing a lot of research, we learned that, you know, the, the 57th Bomb Wing, the uh, 340th Bomb Group, 480th Squadron, um, flew... Uh, their B-25s with obviously an 8 followed by a leather A through Z. Now there was the 46th, 87th, 88th, and 89th and they all did that. Um, so there was actually three B-25s that adorned 8Z. Um, one of them was an early model that was actually buried when Mount Vesuvius erupted out there and, and over in Corsica on there. And then uh, there was one that was shot down over the Brunner Pass 
in the Valley of the Sun. And then there was another one that actually came back after the board was scrapped. So we decided that we were going to honor and, and restore her to resemble 8Z that was shot down and lost in combat. So our museum historian, Ron Asman, um, worked very, very hard and uh, diligently to locate the actual aircraft, the real 8Z, and actually went over to uh, work. We worked with a couple different groups over in Italy. Um, we found that there was a gentleman, Mr. Pio, and uh, him and his father actually witnessed the aircraft crash. Now, what happened was she basically was uh, on a bombing mission to drop white phosphorus on the Flak 88 guns in there so they can come and blow up the Compor North Railroad Bridge. And uh, basically she took a direct, hat, uh, direct hit from Flak, and they feathered the engine. Now, the B-25 can fly no problem on one engine, but it can't climb, and they couldn't get out of the pass. So at that point in time, they, they flew as far as they could to get out, out of the area, and then they basically bailed out, and the plane crashed in the mountainside. Now, the six crew members were actually captured by the Germans and moved from uh, different camps, and uh, three of them, because they had over 41 missions, were executed. Um, and then the, the aircraft basically sat there, and then Mr. Pyle and his dad went up there and started recovering wreckage. And they actually brought down a large portion of that B-25. Uh, some of the stuff actually rolled down the mountainside. They collected it. And they just basically used the stuff around the farm. Like, they took one of the cylinders and the 2600 made a sausage press out of it. They made a beautiful uh, bandsaw uh, made from B-25 parts and German half-track parts. But sadly, Mr. Pyle passed away literally a month before the crew got out there. But they still got to meet the family, and the family was gracious enough to donate everything that their their family had. So we ended up basically getting a shipping container uh, arriving in Michigan from Italy full of the, the wreckage from 8Z. And uh, one, of the, one of the items was the original uh, Bell M7 tail turret controller, which we've now restored to fully operational condition to power our turret. And anything else that we have in there that we can use, we're putting in the airplane um, to be able to make it, you know, is, a, is an honor representation of 8Z and her crew. That's awesome right there that you got uh, honoring the crew and, and those that were uh, executed and lost. Yeah, and, and, the, uh, and the families, you know, of, of these crew members we've been in touch with actually every year, you know, when, uh, you know, during uh, uh, Memorial Day weekend, we try to get reeves laid on their graves and that kind of stuff. But the families entrusted us with, um, for instance, uh, George Hammond, the bombardier. Um, we have a, a family portrait of him that was painted back in 45. We have all the letters that were, you know, given to the family saying that, you know, your son's lost and missing in action. Um, we have his Purple Heart. We have all of his air medals. Uh, we just uh, got Melvin Kelly, who was one of the gunners. We just got all of his personal belongings. And uh, one of the special items that we just received was actually the pilot's parachute canopy that oh, was wow. found in the attic. It was the only U.S. air crew that bailed out in that area. And uh, we know exactly where each crew member actually landed. And this gentleman had this parachute up in his attic. Wow, that's, a pro that's, yeah, that's, that's something. Well, yeah, like I said, that's fantastic. You guys are going to honor the crew. And uh, I don't know, hopefully you have their names on the aircraft probably. Absolutely. Like that. Yep, yeah, that, absolutely. Great. Um, I, you know, for the listener, I apologize for the background noise. We've got something cranking up out on the line. I believe it's uh, the Bell P-39 Air Cobra. Can't really see from here, but yeah, the hazards, rate, the hazards of a, a, a really, really good little air show. You yeah, know? <laughs> definitely. Um, good, good noise to hear. Um, so let's talk. Also, um, let's touch on um, how can people give? How can you, how can you, you, obviously you need money to make this happen? So let's absolutely, talk, let's talk about that. Yeah. So I mean, we're we're a nonprofit, like all nonprofits, and you know. Uh, COVID was really hard on us, but we were very fortunate and lucky that we were able to survive from our membership support uh, and some local grants and that kind of stuff. And we're just excited now that we can finally start getting our youth program going back again now that uh, things are starting to wind down. But uh, anybody that, you know, wants to help us, you can go to our website, which is warbirdsofglory.org, um, you know, buying T-shirts, going to our, you know, any kind of merchandise, just making a cash donation or becoming an actual museum member. And uh, we have different memberships. We have one year. We have three-year, five-year, and then obviously lifetime, which is the, the granddaddy of them all. But uh, what we're doing now between now and actual uh, August 9th is uh, one of our students actually took the logo from the 488th that is adorned on the airplane. Now, we added the sash to cover her because she was originally fully nude with the 488th and uh, actually CNC'd this, this sign out. It's about 40 by 30 inches, and uh, it's three-dimensional. It was all hand painted. Over 40 hours of paint went into this thing to get this thing painted. It's actually our, our museum's artist who does a lot of our hand uh, painted leather patches. But this beautiful sign that's backlit, you can actually win this sign by becoming a museum member. So if you get a one year membership, you get one entry. A three year membership will give you five entries. Uh, five year will give you 10. And a lifetime will give you 20 entries into winning the sign. And then August 9th, 
um, basically the day after the Thunder Over Michigan Air Show. We will do a Facebook live feed post, and we will draw the winner of the sign. And it actually has a really beautiful carrying case, too, that was built for us to haul this thing around that they'll get as well. Um, to keep it protected in. Man, so. that, that would look good in a podcast studio, though, Whitey. It would. And, uh, you know, I, we'll, I'm thinking in my head here, I, when, I'm, when we're done with this, I'm going to go out there and get some photos of that, as well as your nose. Um, your nose and become a lifetime there. member. And become, <laughs> uh, yeah. And 20 inches. And um, it, we'll get photos of this out on to our Facebook page and uh, toss it out there. And we'll, we'll toss it onto our sister Facebook page, The Model Geeks. Yep. And, um, you know, so let let. Let it put it all out there to the you aviation nerds out there. You know, here's a group that has taken you, training them to fix and restore airplanes and learn invaluable history. P- put your money where your mouth is. Yep. Let's, all, let's make it happen. Send these folks a donation. Let's get this airplane built and get it flying. Um, nothing more I'd like to see than another B 25 sitting on the flight line. Uh, hopefully out here at Warbirds, uh, on the, uh, Warbirds on the beach or out here at the Military Aviation Museum, whatever event they happen to be having. And, and, the, and the sayings, every dollar counts, it does. I mean, even a dollar. I mean, it goes a long way. It really does. Because it starts adding them up. I mean, if you have, you know, we joke around and say we got over, I think, 11,000 people now that follow us, you know, worldwide on Facebook. It's like, man, if everybody just donated $100, that would, that would be, I mean, that would be huge. That would be almost yeah. a big Done chunk right of the there, money that right? we need to raise. Yeah. Because we got to raise close to a little over four hundred thousand dollars to be able to get our new home, hangar home. So, yeah. I mean, every little bit helps. Well, you twisted my arm. I'll come out there and do a membership here, um, as Barry did. Our friend Barry, he was, he's the one who pointed me in y'all's direction. So I, I have to come over and, and, and talk to you guys, uh, Patrick. I want to thank you for taking the time to sit down and talk with us, and uh, we'll do uh, what we can on our end to get the word out on on, on the project, Sandbar Mitchell. Um, thanks for, thanks again, and, and we wish you all the best. Thank you guys yeah, so man. much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, man.